In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So as uh, many of you will have no doubt heard already, uh, Muriel Morgan, uh, I'm sorry, not Muriel, excuse me, Lori Morgan uh, passed away on Friday night, um, and uh, his funeral will be held on Tuesday, and of course I'll be uh, preaching on that occasion. But um, it's really difficult to have something like that in mind and not have it kind of spill over into uh, the sermon that happens on Sunday, especially in a, in a congregation as small and intimate as ours, this kind of thing uh, really strikes close to the heart. So uh, I'll have a few thoughts about it, about it today in the context of, of the Epiphany lessons that we have. Uh, a few things about his passing. Uh, he was 93 years old, and he had been married for 70 years to Muriel. Um, some of you will recall a few months ago in September when we celebrated their 70th anniversary with a renewal of vows. We, we took a, a BCP and had them say the same vows that they said 70 years before. That's really uh, quite an extraordinary life. It was a very peaceful death, one of great thoughtfulness and prayerfulness of a sort that is difficult to come by, frankly, uh, because for most of us, uh, when we approach the end, we're, we're usually don't have the kind of consciousness and awareness of ourselves that Lori had the gift to have uh, toward the last hours of his life. And so the family called me and asked me to come and to give him final communion. And as I did that, I did the whole communion service, actually, with the family, as well as the, the rites that we have uh, that have been handed down to us from our tradition uh, to say with the dying. And uh, in particular, there was this prayer, which uh, even now kind of affects me to, to say it, but Lori was actually able to, to pray this on his own. He was able to read this out of the book uh, by himself. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, help me. Father, I place myself in your hands. Holy God, I believe in you, I trust in you, I love you. Those were his final words in prayer. Uh, after that, there was time for him still, of course, to say uh, goodbye individually to his, uh, his children and to his, his grandchildren and uh, to me and to the doctor and to, and to all those who had surrounded him in so much love. One of the things that struck me was something that the doctor said. He said that he really saw his vocation as a doctor who does uh, palliative care uh, to be one who treats his patients with, um, with, with truth and love. And this came up again and again several times. He kept coming back to that, truth and love. And that struck me because it, it resonated uh, with this passage that, that Lori had read about trust and love at the end of life. The, the uh, Latin name for giving somebody communion in the end is called viaticum, and it means provision for the journey. And it comes from the ancient Roman practice of giving soldiers a special allowance before they went out on some sort of journey. Uh, it became a, a term of law in, in Rome after that as a kind of, um, as the, the provision that was given to someone who was on their way in a journey and was even used in European courts. And of course, so Christians picked it up as well as being that, that thing that we give people before they set off on a journey to an unknown land. Or is it so unknown? One of the things that was interesting about Lori, for anyone that knew him, was his amazing certainty in the promises that we have, that we've received through the scriptures, through the Holy Spirit, through the assurances of the signs that God sends us. And Lori was a big believer in signs, as anyone that, that knew him knew. Uh, I could count on every couple of weeks or months, I would get a package, not a letter, a package from Lori uh, in my box here at the church. And it would have a several page handwritten letter from him, as well as photocopied articles that had been highlighted and annotated for me about the signs that he was seeing in our world of the coming of God. Uh, Lori was someone who believed very much that the world was near its end and that Jesus would come uh, any day now. And he and I may not have seen quite eye to eye about that issue or, or some other political issues, and that was kind of the point for Lori. Uh, he loved to debate these issues. He loved to look for these signs and to discuss them and to argue them. In fact, my predecessor uh, used to send all the students, the theological students that came through here in, in his time, he used to send them to meet with Lori at least once. And Lori told me he wasn't quite sure why Andrew did that, but he had a theory that it was because uh, he wanted them to kind of have their kind of theological and scriptural chops kind of tested. <laughs> Lori understood that he existed in a certain tension with the kind of theology that, that most Anglicans hold. 
And that's okay, because in the Anglican Church, we've always held a kind of big tent theology that has had room to accommodate people of many different beliefs, because we as Anglicans believe that we don't have all the answers. We might have a few answers, but we don't have all the answers, and certainly not about things that can be debated from different perspectives. Many times he and I would talk about how a certain scripture could be interpreted in several ways, and he really did challenge me to go back to my books and, and kind of bring things out. And I remember spending a couple of hours one day with him discussing uh, the roots of biblical criticism as we have it in the 20th century and 21st century in the mainline denominations and textual criticism and, and historical methods of, of scriptural interpretation. And, uh, and it was a very interesting discussion. Uh, he was certainly not one to ever back down. <laughs> Laurie was fun. The other thing about Laurie, though, was the enormous amount of love that radiated from him as a person, and it was evident to all those around him. The reason that he wanted to tell us about Israel is because he cared deeply for us and loved us and wanted us to see through his eyes what he was seeing, the things that gave him such assurance that he was held in love by God, by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus and the Father. What Epiphany shows us is that the signs that come from God come in a multitude of ways to various people throughout the earth. I mean, these three uh, kings, it doesn't say they're kings, by the way, in scripture. That's just something people kind of added later. Uh, these wise men, these magi, who were they exactly? I mean, some people say they were more like astrologers, you know, looking for the stars as signs of what might be heavenly portents, which is interesting because if that's true, then they interpreted the stars correctly. So does that mean that astrology is real? Question mark. Others say, no, no, they're more like scientists. You know, they, they saw something strange in the heavens and wondrous. Maybe it was a comet or an interesting conjunction of stars and planets, and they decided to follow that where it led. And somehow that led them to Jerusalem. Others say, no, no, we just have to look at them as being the foreigner, the, the, the Gentile being called to the promises of Israel, to the God who, as we see in Isaiah, has a, a promise that something will arise in Israel that will make Israel a blessing, that will be a blessing to the whole world, that Israel is blessed to be a blessing. However we look at it, what happens in Epiphany is something that spills over into the entire earth. What we see is something that transcends the individual promise given to one particular people in one particular corner of the earth, but rather something that was given to all people throughout time and space. Otherwise, how could those people so far away in Persia or Asia or wherever they were from, out east somewhere, maybe Jersey, how was it that they were able to see in something so obscure as the heavens, they were able to see something of God's promises for them, something so compelling to undertake such an arduous and difficult journey to an unknown land? Journeys to unknown lands who does that sort of thing without the surety and promise of truth and love? Wherever we might come from, wherever we may be on this earth, there are signs for us to see. We might argue about what they are. The particular signs that reach us might be different from one person to the next. Some people looking up in the heavens, they see God writ large. How many physicists have written about their faith rooted in the pure mathematics of studying the stars and their motions? or how they form in these swirling galaxies millions and millions of light years away? How many people have discovered God in the hearts of other people as they have served them in love and compassion? How many people have found God in scripture, however they might have received it in whatever way in their lives at whatever time? The truth is that God is always trying to reach us by sending signs of love and truth into this world. Lori lived in that hope because he had seen those signs. He had read them and he believed them. So my challenge to us uh, this week as we reflect on these scriptures and Epiphany and Lori and, and, and his family and all those things is, is how can we cultivate within ourselves the sort of sight that can see those signs for what they are, however they might come to us in our various vocations and lives and interests. What is it about people like Lori or the wise men or or Mary, or Joseph, or any of these people, that they were able to see something that gave them such surety of truth and love? What sort of habits of a person leads toward that kind of seeing? So now I'm gonna open this up as I commonly do, and that's kind of my, my question, I guess, for us, is how do we cultivate the habits that help us see these signs? If I can get this out. <laughs> 